Hi guys, welcome to NASA Launchpad. I'm your host, Vince Whitfield. Ah, the North Pole, home of great things like ice, snow, and dancing lights in the sky. That's right, dancing lights in the sky. And you all know what I'm talking about, the Aurora Borealis, or the Northern Lights. Did you know that the beautiful bands of shimmering light that fill the sky at the northern latitudes also put on a show at the southern latitudes at the same time? Yep, it's called the Aurora Australis, or the southern lights. From space, the auroras are even more breathtaking. Take a look at the southern lights in action over Antarctica. These pictures were taken by one of NASA's satellites. Pretty cool. So from time to time, colorful lights fill the sky. I don't know about you, but personally, I think that's kind of weird. And I'm not the only one. Since prehistoric times, humans have been captivated by the auroral lights. In fact, it's theorized that this cave painting created by a Cro-Magnon is the earliest depiction of the aurora. It's roughly 32,000 years old. And in the year 1570, this drawing was created with a series of candles above the clouds signifying the aurora. For thousands of years, these dancing lights have shaped art, history, and religion. It was in 1619 when Galileo named these lights the Aurora Borealis, after the Roman god of mourning, Aurora. It was his belief that the lights were caused by sunlight reflecting off of Earth's atmosphere. Turns out he was very wrong, but hey, that's what science is all about. Asking questions and finding the answers so that we can ask new questions all over again. So, why do the auroras exist? And what causes these spectacular light shows in the sky? In order to answer that, we need to take a look at Earth's magnetosphere. Well, we all know that Earth has a north and a south pole. That's how compasses work. Because of its molten iron core, Earth is actually a giant magnet with poles at both ends. The volume of space within this magnetic field is called the magnetosphere. I know it doesn't look like a sphere, but there's a reason for that. Solar winds produced by the sun blast into Earth's magnetosphere, actually changing its shape. That darn sun turning our beautiful magnetic sphere into a magnetic mess. It's a good thing though, solar winds can be dangerous. They're filled with deadly radiation and it's actually our malleable magnetosphere that takes the brunt of solar winds. So if it weren't for our magnetosphere shielding us from most of that radiation, life on Earth may very well not exist. The side of the magnetosphere that gets smacked by the solar winds is known as the day side magnetosphere. Makes sense because that's the side facing the sun. The opposite side is the magneto tail. I know it sounds like I'm making up words, but well, this is where it all comes together. Okay, so we already know that solar winds leave the sun, travel through space, and eventually slam into the Earth's protective magnetosphere. This energy causes a change in the shape of the magnetic tail. Particles trapped in the tail are allowed to interact with Earth's atmosphere, creating the auroras. Every once in a while, a geomagnetically disturbed period known as a substorm occurs, and the auroras brighten and extend poleward. Scientists wanted to know more about these substorms. Why were electrons being accelerated so explosively into the Earth's atmosphere? What caused a single auroral ribbon to break into several ribbons or clusters of ribbons that race north and south? Enter Themis, NASA's time, history of events, and macro scale interactions during Substorm's mission. We'll just stick with Themis. Launched in February of 2007, the rocket carrying Themis arrived in space and released five identical probes. It was the job of the Themis probes to align themselves over the North American continent and help scientists to understand what triggers the onset of substorms. And Themis answered a lot of questions. What did Themis discover about bright substorms? They're really caused by something pretty simple. Themis found out about a little thing known as magnetic reconnection. Basically, the outer magnetic field lines of the magnetotel capture and store solar wind energy until the field lines are stretched out like rubber bands. During substorms, the stretched magnetic field is overloaded with too much energy and the lines snap back like a giant slingshot, flinging electrically charged particles trapped in the magnetic tail toward Earth at high speeds. As the particles bombard the Earth's upper atmosphere, the electrons excite the oxygen and nitrogen atoms in the atmosphere, producing the red, green and blue lights of these miraculous auroras. Although substorms create beautiful art in the sky, they actually create problems too. 
an intense substorm can interfere with GPS signals, radio signals, and even cause power outages. So what's next? Well, using Themis, scientists hope to one day better understand when a substorm will occur and how powerful it may be. This kind of information is really going to come in handy. Got to protect the next generation of explorers. That's you, by the way, when you venture away from Earth. And for us explorers sticking to life on Earth, this kind of information will help us to protect our microelectronics. Don't want any interruptions talking on our cell phones, using our GPS units, and using all of the yet to be invented tools and gadgets. I'm Vince Whitfield, and this is NASA Launchpad. Catch you later.